If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Yona, thank you for joining me on the show today. This is truly an honor. I've been waiting to have you on and just thanks for uh, sharing your uh, valuable time with us today. My pleasure, Sean. I appreciate you inviting me to uh, this awesome podcast. I'm excited to to join you and talk about some things that you know, maybe a interesting novelty to some of our listeners today. Yes, I'm excited about this. So listeners, I know I mentioned this in the intro, but Yona is the cost segregation, you know, tax wizard of when it comes to real estate investing. And I've mentioned this on countless episodes before how one of the major benefits of investing in real estate is the tax benefits really helps you grow wealth, kind of adds rocket fuel to your you know wealth um, trajectory, and you're allowed you could, you're just able to compound wealth at a faster rate because you're not giving back all that gain to taxes. And as we all know, our, our biggest expense in life is usually to Uncle Sam. So it's it's nice when we can kind of put put some of that away. Um, but yeah, I just want to I guess we'll just jump right into it. Kind of give a, a background if you don't mind, Yona, uh, on yourself how you got to where you are today, that would be great. Sure. Absolutely. A uh, little background. There's not much to say about me because I'm, um, you know, oh, that's not true. Much now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, let's see, let's go back all the way to the beginning. Now I was, um, you know, a professional career really took off. I'd say in the last five years or so, five, six years. But uh, before that, I was a teacher for many years, about 15 years. And that's really all, always been my passion uh, since really like junior high school. I was a teacher uh, in, in various different levels, whether it was tutoring people or just a kind of community events. I think so it was really, you know, maybe it came from my grandmother who was a teacher. Also, my mother was a teacher. You know, it came kind of came naturally to me. Um, but at a certain point, you realize, well, hmm, is this teacher salary really going to be helping, you know, build a generational wealth or, or building, you know, anything that really can help not just myself, but my family, my children. And it came a certain point. I was like, okay, I got to figure something else out. And real estate was just like the thing that I was drawn to uh, for various reasons. And um, I didn't really have any professional background in real estate whatsoever. And to be honest, I never really liked business whatsoever. I was really enjoyed just just kind of being, just living, enjoying life, helping people, teaching at a nonprofit charities, you know, helping people. That's kind of, you know, community life is very important to me. Family life, I have six kids. So it's really important to me just to be with them and to, you know, kind of live my best life. And, but, you know, when you start getting in, you know, have more debt and have more, you know, bills and more expenses and everything like that, you got to figure something out. Um, so at a certain point, that's what happened. Reached out to some friends. They all said real estate is a great, way to do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, you don't really need any formal education to pursue a career in real estate. Really. I mean, you can, you can literally learn a tremendous amount online or just apprenticing, just hanging out and learning from those people who are have been doing it already. And that's exactly what I did. And, and the second thing that compelled me was that there's really no uh, limit to the amount of money you could potentially make with a uh, real estate career, You know, whatever various path you decide to take within it, if you want to go and become a lawyer or a doctor or architect or whatever it is, there's usually like a ceiling, right? You know, you can only make so much because you're trading your time for money. Maybe you're adding some value, but et cetera. In the end of the day, I didn't want to go that route. So I, I have, you know, more training and more um, formal education. So I, I took the route of cost segregation, uh, <laughs> the road less traveled, right? Um, you know, I started out doing some fix and flips and, and a real estate broker and did some mortgage brokers, just literally lit learning everything there was to know about real estate, commercial real estate specifically. And then I, I got hired by this company, Madison Specs, which is the largest national cost segregation company. And I just like fell into the role, which was, you know, business development. And I found very quickly that nobody knew what this thing was. Like, what is cost segregation? I mean, some of your listeners are like, okay, this is probably the first time I've ever heard this term before. Maybe I heard the term before, but don't really understand it, don't know what it is. And that's why you're listening to the show. Um, but 
that's what I found with so many other people. I was talking to all my friends and all my colleagues and all my former clients and everything like for the years that I was working in real estate and nobody knew what it was. Right. And there was a small few who were like, yes, of course we know what this is. We use it and we don't haven't paid taxes in a year, you know, in decades. But the vast majority were like, we have no idea what this is. And that just opened up to me, like as a teacher, when you open up like a subject that is like clouded in mystery or, or whatever, and you're like, nobody knows what this is, that's opportunity. There's opportunity for you to go and teach people and educate the masses. And that's exactly what I did. Oh, that's awesome. And that's what this world has become, which I love is it's, it, you're coming from a place of, of giving value. Um, and I think that's what more people need to focus on because yeah, in the end, it's going to help you. Yeah. Givers gain. But the fact that like, I see your content all the time, you're giving it for free. You're putting out in the world. And then us as consumers need to be smart enough to go find you and, and actually take a hold of that content and put it to use. Cause like you said, Cost segregation has been around for a long time, but not many people have, have known about it. N not even sophisticated investors haven't known it probably until recently. Um, I didn't know about it until probably 2016, 17. Um, but yeah, it's super powerful and we'll jump into that. But I just want to also hit on a, a point you made to the listeners and that's you don't need to have like a traditional or sophisticated education to invest in real estate. Not at all. Like I say... You can get your education from the University of YouTube and Google or University of Podcasts, you know, and and mentorship, like you mentioned. I'm a big proponent of that. I have a mentor and I know I'll always have mentors because why not? Someone is where you want to be one day. Why not go give them value? And then in turn, they will bring value back to you and pull you up to where they are. So yeah, I just want to hit on that. That's a great point. But yeah, in terms of cost segregation, I guess let's just get into it, explain it, define it in, in as simple as possible terms for the, for the average person. I'll do my best. Um, the, first, <laughs> the first thing we got to understand is it's a, it's a weird name for advanced depreciation. That's all it is. So just think about depreciation. And if you know what, what, what depreciation is, is simply it is a tax deduction that you get for investing or owning real estate. Besides for your personal residence, any property that you own you get to take this deduction, which literally is the ability to write off the entire value of your property over a, a long period of time. And what I mean by write off is take tax deductions against your income, uh, your income tax. So depreciation, even though it means, right, the definition is like, okay, going down in value, right? Someone's going down in value, it's depreciating. Really, it's just a borrowed term. And this is really important to remember. It's a borrowed term the IRS gave to this deduction called depreciation. So it doesn't really mean that your property is going down in value. In fact, your property is probably going up in value. It's probably appreciating. Notice they don't give a deduction called appreciation. <laughs> they give a deduction called depreciation based on the principle that your property and things go down in value as time goes on. So they're enabling you to take a tax write-off against that. Why they did that? To this day, it's still a mystery, right? Why they created such a thing. But essentially, I mean, there is some sense to it because things go, some things have a useful life. And, and once the thing has no more useful life, then, uh, you know, it has no more value. So they want to encourage people to uh, buy things, buy property, buy, uh, you know, objects, et cetera. So they want to incentivize you to give you a tax write off to keep when that runs out, buy another one because now we've given you that money back, so to speak, through the uh, guise of, tax deductions, now you can go back and reinvest that. Nevertheless, it is a borrowed term and it's based on the purchase price the day that you buy the property. For commercial properties, you're allowed to take that deduction over a 39-year period, right? Meaning take your purchase price, subtract a certain amount for the land, a small amount usually. Uh, land does not depreciate, but the building and anything is on top of the land does. And so you can take that as a tax write-off. Um, for multifamily or any other residential properties, it's over a 27 and a half year period. And these are two 39, 27 and a half are pretty arbitrary. No one can really figure out why they've given these numbers, <laughs> but they say, yes, your building has a useful life of 27 and a half years, but that's not really true because it is relative. If you buy a building today in 2021 that was built in 1935, you get to start your depreciation schedule from scratch. Your 27 and a half years starts today based on your purchase price, okay? And if you go and sell it uh, a year from now for 
uh, you know, twice the price, that new buyer gets to start his 27 and a half years of deductions from scratch based on that new purchase price. Okay, so it is really, like I said, it's a relative deduction and it is kind of a borrowed term. So that's in a nutshell what depreciation is. Okay, so now that we got that, we have the foundation to stand on, we can understand cost segregation, the advanced form of depreciation. Okay, the advanced form is simply that there are components within your property that actually depreciate according to the tax code on a faster rate than just the structure. The structure is that that's what depreciates on a 27 and a half or 39 year schedule. But there are many things, components inside your property, like personal property that can be furniture or even things like you wouldn't think of um, that are non structural, like carpeting or, or vinyl flooring or wall coverings, lighting, window treatments, appliances, furniture, all that stuff I just listed, according to the IRS, depreciates on a five year schedule. Okay. Cost segregation is the process, the engineering process. Okay. So it involves an engineer to come down and break down the property from an engineering perspective and identify and tell you all the individual components that are in there and what they, how much they, what schedule essentially they depreciate on and how much value is in those individual components that now you can take as a tax write off. Okay. So that's chapter one. <laughs> Any <Chapter. laughs> So far, so good. That's great. Yeah. And I'd, I'd probably rewind that back, listen to it again, but that, yeah, that's phenomenal. And so then from that standpoint, what, why would you want to do that? And, and what are the benefits of, cause you're paying listeners, if you don't know, you're paying, obviously paying for that service. What are the benefits? Yeah. The, the main thing is what we're doing is we are able to, I mean, the method of conservation allows you to front load a certain percentage or a certain amount of the property that actually depreciates on these faster schedules. So for example, that personal property, all that stuff that I listed before and many other things can sometimes add up to be like 20 or 30 or 40% of the total value of that property. And if you can take those deductions at a faster rate, that just simply means you'll have larger tax write-offs in the earlier years of ownership, which is the time value of money. It's it's utilizing those tax deductions now when you need them, when you can use them instead of just waiting, you know, 39 years or 27 years, especially if you're not planning on holding the building or, you know, for that long, but you want to take advantage as much as you can. And that's the main uh, principle is reduce your income tax liability by creating or front loading more deductions. Yep. And that's, that's what's so powerful about it because you can take that up front. And you know, like you mentioned, time value of money, then you can now take the money now to invest it in something else. One, beat inflation, which we're in the middle of right now, and two, grow that money now instead of in the future. Um, That's exactly right. And it's it's such a powerful strategy. And yeah, sometimes like like you said earlier, I wonder why they they do it because it's it's such a benefit to us investors. But at the on the other side of the coin, I understand it because currently we're in you know a four million unit housing deficit in the United States. So they want to incentivize us one to develop new property and two to maintain existing. So I get it from that standpoint. But yeah, so when I first heard about cost segregation and then also with bonus depreciation and with the new tax law, I just couldn't believe it at first. Like this, this seems too good to be true. But it makes sense from that standpoint that we want to maintain housing and build new housing, but it's, it's super powerful to one grow wealth and, and to just be able to acquire more assets. But I want to kind of get into, so now, now that we've kind of defined what it is, um, what is it more powerful in certain asset classes than others within real estate? Um, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, it is something that can be done, like I said, on any type of property, but yep. different types of properties will have different benefits. Um, and so what our job as the engineers, and we're you know a focused company that fo- you know we solely do this, our engineers are trained to you know look at every component within and without the property, I mean, outside as well. There's another component called land improvements, which is anything that is outside the building that is on top of the land, depreciates on a 15-year schedule. Again, accelerated depreciation, getting these deductions faster. And on that note of the land improvements, 
um, there is an asset class that has like 10 times more benefit sometimes than any other type of property. And that's mobile home parks. And I want to yeah. kind of go into this for a second, because typically speaking, um, any property that you buy, the main value is going to be in the structure. Okay. We're talking about the walls, the roof, the floor, foundation, right? Uh, windows, doors, main electric, main plumbing, all those are the infrastructure and structural components that always contains the the majority, vast majority of the value of the property to the point where like a multifamily property, and this is the multifamily money podcast, right? <laughs> multifamily is typically we're talking about like 20 to 30% of your property value is going to be in those faster components. Okay. Yep. Um, sometimes less, sometimes more, but typically, you know, 90% of properties fall in that, in that window. Okay. Um, so we're talking about the personal property, all the furniture, appliances, fixtures, everything we talked about before, the land improvements, landscaping, pavement, concrete, right? Playground equipment can be involved, fencing, storm drainage, well, you know, all that kind of stuff, signage, anything outside, that's all 15 year property. Mobile home parks, which are, you know, kind of like multifamily in a way, right? And, no, and there's a lot, yeah. a lot of people kind of venturing into that asset class stuff from multifamily because it has a lot of similarities. But the one thing that is different is that in many cases, as an owner of a park, you may not actually own any of the homes, the mobile homes themselves. You just own the land and the land improvements. And you're, and you're leasing essentially the spaces, the concrete spaces that those homes sit on, which the tenants own themselves, right? They're called tenant right. owned homes um, as opposed to park owned homes. Those are the terms used in the industry. Now, when you just own a mobile home park and just the land, land improvement, guess what? There's very little structure, okay? There's very little structure maybe some infrastructure thing, or maybe there's a clubhouse, maybe there's an office, maybe you might have a laundry room or something like that. But otherwise, infrastructure may make it maybe like, you know, the power lines or sewage lines and things like that. Those you own, there's going to have components and structural components, but everything else is essentially going to be land improvements. And we're talking about 50 to 80% of the value is going to be in those land improvements, meaning the landscaping, the concrete, pavement, whatever it is. So that's huge. I mean, that's a huge value. So we talk about, are there asset classes that have a bigger value than others? You know, mobile home park is kind of off the charts. Is uh, What about golf courses? That seems similar when it's like same, all land improvements. Same idea. Yeah, yeah, same idea. That's awesome. So that's, a. I love talking about this stuff because it's a great way, depending where you are on your wealth journey, there's time where you need more cash flow. There's time where you need appreciation and there's time when you need more tax benefits. So it's great to know that there's some avenues you can take to, to get a stronger tax benefit, depreciation benefit. Um, but like you said, this is the multifamily money podcast. So let's, let's get back to the, the multifamily. Is there, in your opinion, is there a minimum amount of units or structure size where you may not want to pay for cost segregation? Or, or do you feel that it doesn't matter? There's a benefit no matter the, the unit or size. There's usually going to be a benefit, um, you know, no matter what, uh, because the depreciation is based on your purchase price. Okay. And so we're going to segregate that cost. Again, there's the name. We're segregating the cost. We are breaking down that purchase price, that cost into different categories, different components that are going to depreciate faster or at faster rates. Um, my usual rule of thumb is anything over a half a million dollar purchase price is a no brainer. Uh, you know, it's it just, there's so much value there. There's obviously a fee. There's, is, you know, it costs money to get this done. Something you have to hire an engineering company uh, like us that can come out and do the actual study. It costs a little bit of money. I mean, not a tremendous amount. It's not contingent on the tax savings. It's nothing like that. It's not a percentage of your, of your, you know, purchase price, but it is a fee, whatever that is, you know, a few thousand bucks. Right. So, how, however much tax benefit you're going to get through the accelerating of that depreciation is, is certainly going to impact whether or not that's going to benefit you. In terms of unit count, I mean, we do single families even. I mean, there are many times, it doesn't really matter the unit count. You may have more benefit when you have a larger unit count um, because maybe you know, there are more Think about it, the more appliances, right? In one unit, you just have one set. Uh, sometimes you have more appliances. Other times where you'll have less. Um, but there, like I said, that range of 20 to 30%, it's usually a pretty good rule of thumb to go by. So if you have a million dollar property and you have, you know, you can take $200,000, let's just think of the low end of accelerated depreciation, 
deductions, that means your normal depreciation may have been around $30,000 and now you're taking an extra 200 in the first five years or the first year even, which we can get to in a second, something called bonus depreciation. Um, then that's a trend is on a value, especially we only have to pay a few thousand bucks to get it done. That's awesome. Yeah. Let's just jump right into to bonus depreciation and, and how that can like supercharge this whole thing. Yeah. So bonus depreciation is essentially a, um, a rule that came about a few years ago with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the, the latest tax reform, some people call it the Trump tax reform, right? Yeah. They created a rule called 100% bonus depreciation. Previously, there was something called bonus depreciation, which allows you to front load depreciation. But essentially what this new rule said was any property that you buy or develop, construct, even if it's a used property, any once you've done the cost segregation study and have accelerated the depreciation to faster rates, faster lives, five year, 15 year, like we mentioned, you have the option to take that entire amount of the accelerated portion in the first year. So that's called 100% bonus depreciation. So if you get you know 20% of your million dollar property, $200,000, that you can spread at a faster rate, but now you can take that all up front and as a lump sum in the first year. I mean, that's a huge, it's a game changer for a lot of people. You're literally reducing your taxes by, you know, to zero and then creating passive losses, creating these extra losses that can just carry forward. You can you know, use them in future years. Yeah, it's, it's so huge. So let's, let's take that as an example. You have $200,000 in bonus depreciation. Now, what you can do with that 200 is it, it can offset any of that cash flow you're going to get from the property you just bought or if you're what they call a real estate professional, so someone that spends at least 750 hours a year in the real estate realm, you can actually take that 200,000, not only offset against that passive income or any other passive income, but against any active income that you may be making. And like what we were talking about before, this is a, such a fast way to grow wealth, especially with time value money, you're getting all that, you're keeping all that money up front instead of paying taxes, you're keeping it now and then you can go deploy it to, to grow your wealth and also hedge against inflation. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, bonus, yeah, it's, it's really incredible, but is it, it's tapering down, is that correct? Is that, that, is that correct. was part of the tax reform? Part of the tax reform is they put it into place in 2017 and it was meant to last through 2022. Um, the 100% bonus depreciation. And then they have it set up as of now to start tapering off, to start phasing, um, excuse me, phasing out in 2023. So it's going to go down to 80% and then 20% each year until 2028 when it, there's no longer going to be any bonus depreciation. You still will be able to use 100%, excuse me, cost segregation right. in the traditional sense, uh, not only for the remaining percentage. So that 80% can be bonus, the remaining 20% can still use the cost seg method. And, um, but, you know, going forward, that's, as far as we know, that's going to continue that uh, cost segregation. And, you know, who knows? There may be a change to that, you know? It, it may have, I think there's a lot of people that are going to try to lobby and try to see if we can continue the 100% bonus depreciation for as long as we can. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of talk in the political sphere right now about, you know, the, the new potential proposed tax laws and especially with the 1031 and, and in, you know, I'm no politician and, and, you know, I haven't read this document from, you know, front to end. I don't, I don't know many people who have, but um, what I feel is that it's, it's more of they're putting all their chips on the table at once. So then they can kind of taper back as they're bargaining and, and kind of get some of what they want, but where it's proposed now, I don't see it ending there just because like I mentioned earlier, we have such a housing deficit, 4 million units, and you're going to take away one of the, the most important incentives to invest in housing. Uh, I just don't see that happening. And same with cost segregation and bonus depreciation. I just, I, I, they might amend it a little bit, but I just don't see it to the extent that they're proposing now. I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on that or if you even want to get into that. But. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope that's the case, right? I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I hope, and I think we all do, and all the, the syndicators and real estate investors out there who are who are and have been taking advantage of this for the past several years to, I mean, to the nth degree. I mean, literally people taking millions and millions of dollars of write-offs 
Um, I think a lot of people are going to want to continue that. And, you know, there are some incentives. You know, obviously, it, it helps to spur the economy, right? People are reinvesting that money. They're, they're buying more. They're reinvesting more into the communities uh, and making a lot of these places better. I mean, that's really helping drive prices up. So that, I mean, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it, I think what it does do is it contributes to the growth of the economy because the people are moving to, to areas where, you know, where jobs are growing, you know, people are moving to areas where there's growth happening, you know, and those, I guess, communities or those uh, specific markets, if you will, are seeing a lot of growth. And therefore, there's, there's being a lot more being put back into uh, the housing market, as well as, you know, the economy in general. So I think it's a good thing all around. I agree. And then as those values go up is, you know, as much as us investors don't necessarily want it to when we're buying, definitely when we're selling, but uh, as they go up, the tax revenue goes up. So it's, it's helping, it's helping the community as long as, you know, they're deploying those, that money in the right way, it's, it's helping the community. So in the end, it all comes around and, you know, some people argue, well, why, why they, you know, defer the taxes. Well, at the end, the community is still getting the taxes. The community where we're investing is still getting the taxes. We're improving the living conditions of people in that community. At the same time, we're helping our investors keep more of their hard-earned money to further invest. So I just think it's a win-win all around. Um, obviously, Sean's biased, but uh, I, th I think it's uh, a win-win all around. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I could, I could and want to talk about this all day long. Um, but is there anything specific that I haven't asked that you'd want to get into on the, on the topic of, of bonus appreciation cost segregation? I think a lot of people are confused and just, you know, they hear this word, maybe they listen to the podcast, they kind of get a little bit right. Okay. We're breaking this down. So then, well, okay. That applies to my taxes. Now I can get this. There are a lot of questions out there and I'm literally on the phone, you know, all <laughs> every yeah. day. Uh, many times, you know, many times a day with people just trying to understand this process better. Um, I think a few things that will help to understand this is number one, you know, this is an engineering, it's totally recognized for the, by the IRS created, not just recognized, created, right? This is in the tax code. This isn't some like, you know, crazy uh, strategy out there that's, that's going to throw red flags at you and say, no, this is directly. In fact, the IRS considers this the correct way to depreciate your property. They have created this cost recovery system, which tells you all these different assets and how you should be taking these depreciation deductions. So we're just doing it the correct way. Uh, the one thing that's really strange about that is the IRS does not enforce it. They don't say, okay, well, you're doing it wrong by just doing straight line, you know, lumping it all together on a 27 half. You're doing it wrong. You got to redo it. No, they're just going to, they're not going to tell you about these extra deductions. And I think that's right. one, one, one thing that I, you know, highly, you know, say over and over and over again is it's your money, right? We have to educate ourselves. And sometimes a lot of people, including myself um, for, for many, many, many years, was like, okay, taxes, and my brain shuts off, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I have an accountant, I have someone else that deals with that. Like, I can't even think about that. But when you're in, when you're an entrepreneur, right? And when you're in real estate, which most real estate investors have that, have that um, tendency or have that, you know, part about them that are entrepreneurs are going to, you know, feel, okay, well, I need to take the reins of this bull, you know, I need to take the, uh, I think I mixed up two cliches there, right? I got to take the reins, <laughs> right? I got to take the bull by the horn. By the way, and yep. the, the point is, is you, you got to educate yourself. Do not rely on a CPA or an accountant to just be, because most of them, you know, I, I love them. They're great, you know, when they're doing it right, but most of them are just punching numbers. Most of them are just yep. taking your income, taking your receipts, whatever it is, plugging those numbers in, and that's it. They're not necessarily strategizing with you um, unless you pay, you know, extra, you know, have a tax advisor, a strategist that sometimes it, it pays to do that, but they're not going to be telling you that. So you got to educate yourself. You got to listen to podcasts like this, where you're going to learn these extra strategies. You're going to figure out how can I, you know, save money here, save money there. How can I uh, use this strategy to, to help grow my wealth? Uh, how can I do what the rich are doing, what the most wealthy people are taking advantage because they're paying for those tax advisors, right? To make sure that they're keeping all their money or as much as possible. And so play the game. That's what, that's what I want to say. Exactly. There's, there's nothing shady about this. It's completely above board. 
It's written in the tax code. It's just, you need to take advantage of it. And like, like Yona mentioned, the IRS is not going to tell you when you're wrong, when it benefits them. They'll, they'll tell you when, when you're wrong, when it doesn't benefit them. <laughs> but this, this is a case where it's completely written in the code above board. And like you said, take advantage of the rules, take advantage of the game that is there to help you <laughs> grow wealth for your future. And yeah, I, I couldn't say it better. Thanks for, for, for pointing that out. And yeah, it's, it's one of those things that just, it just makes it such a different game. So I, I came from traditional finance. So worked for a company that had, you know, funds, ETFs, mutual funds. Um, yeah. And you, you can't take advantage of that, of that type of, of powerful tool when you invest, how we're kind of conditioned as a society to think this is the only way to invest, you know, get my 401k with my mutual funds and ETFs. No, that's, you know, that's not how it's done um, by, by, like you said, by the wealthy and, and the richest in the world. They're using real estate. It's like that quote from Andrew Carnegie. My listeners are probably sick of me saying this because I bring it up all the time, but, you know, 90% of millionaires own real estate. Yep. And, and whether it's because they became a millionaire because of real estate or they became a millionaire and then invested in real estate and became even, even wealthier because of the benefits. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people do. I mean, what, what I've seen is vast majority of people, they make money from other businesses and they, and they pour that money into real estate because it's wealth preservation, right? It has long-term appreciation. There's, you know, there's the tax benefits that come along with it as well. And so it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a full-time real estate investor in order to take advantage of some of these things we're talking about here. Exactly. Well, if someone wanted to use your services, how would they get in contact with you? I mean, the best way you can reach me is on LinkedIn. Obviously, that's the place I hang out most. Uh, you can go to make sure, yeah, and, and do send me a connection on LinkedIn and tell me you listen to Multifamily Money Podcast. I'd love that and give Sean the feedback for that as well. Um, you can check out yonaweiss.com. That's my website, our company, Madison Specs. Uh, we're the largest national conservation company. So you can check us out. We have some case studies and a lot of frequently asked questions and things like that. There are resources for you. That's awesome. Well, I would definitely check them out. And if you're, if you've recently bought property, you intend to buy property, definitely reach out to Yona. I deploy this strategy. I will continue to deploy, deploy this strategy as long as possible. It's incredibly powerful to grow your wealth. Obviously this, this show is about multifamily money. So it's not what you make, but what you keep. And my, my last question to you, Yona, is, is based off of that. So the show, every Monday we talk about multifamily. Every Friday we talk about finance, personal finance. So for the listeners, if you give one piece of advice on each topic, one, why, why do you like real estate as a way to grow wealth? And two, from a personal finance standpoint, what's a piece of advice over your career that you would give that you wish you knew when you were younger? The best advice I would say, um, and, and really why, why I love real estate, I think that's, that's the question, right? What, what, what I like most about it is, um, you know, the, for me, more than anything else, it's been the community. It's been just coming across and meeting and networking with so many like-minded individuals where, uh, you know, there's not, because people have the entrepreneurial spirit. There are people out there with the abundance mindset, trying to help each other, trying to share content, share the wealth. I mean, I've been on a guest on you know over 200 podcasts at this point, and that's that's over 200 people out there that are multifamily or real estate investors. And that's just some of them that they're just sharing content. They're just sharing a wealth of knowledge, information out there for you and for us, for everyone to benefit from. And so that's what I love the most. I mean, that community that I've built over these years uh, through the industry is just uh, to me incredible. That's and, awesome. And the advice that I would give is related to that is spend the time making those connections, going to networking events, if you can still, right? Doing the on now, you know, with, with uh, the pandemic, everyone started doing Zoom things. I started a Zoom networking event every Wednesday we meet, you know, with real estate investors and, it's great just to share the company with others who are doing things that you're doing or that you're aspiring to do. Because when you surround yourself with people who are either in your shoes or in a similar place where you are or you want to be, you will, I right, guarantee, not, not you might, you will grow 
through that. And, and you will get to meet those goals uh, that you set for yourself. Oh, that's awesome. I couldn't agree with that more. It's all about, you're all about networking. Your network is your net worth and you surround yourself with the people that you want to become and it'll happen. You know, obviously it comes with hard work. It's not easy, but that's, that's kind of the first step to take because why, why go on a journey by yourself? That's no fun. Surround, surround yourself with people who are doing what you want to do and you'll get there a lot faster, a lot. Trust me. I've, I've tried both ways and you'll get there a lot faster when you sur surround yourself with the right people. Well, Yona, I really appreciate your time. You're Trevor Tro, uh, you're a, excuse me, I always get that expression wrong. You're a wealth of knowledge and I really appreciate you. And I hope we can connect in the future again because I enjoy talking to this topic. But yeah, thank you for your time. It's uh, been my pleasure. Thank you for having me and uh, hope we can do this again sometime. All right, thanks. All right, catch you on the next one. Hey, this is Sean Winslow. After being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you, I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.